Welcome, my name is Paul Hamblin, I'm Editor of Logistics Business, and you're watching the latest in our series of expert panels that accompany the Logistic Business uh, virtual show. The theme of this panel is robotics and automation, and specifically we'd like to get into the affordability of robotics and automation. And I'm joined by experts from across the industry uh, to discuss the aspects of this sector that matter and the parts of it that you should be considering most in your decision making, the do's and the don'ts, and also a cross section of the sort of products and solutions that are available. Uh, it's important to say that this isn't about formal sales pitches, there's going to be no death by PowerPoint, um, we're going to just be talking basically, so please do send your questions using the chat facility on the screen and our experts will be delighted to engage uh, either now or in the future on those so thank you for that um, without further ado uh, let's begin i'll ask everyone to introduce themselves starting with uh, you adam if you wouldn't mind okay yeah well thanks very much so i'm adam fox and i am a business development manager for swisslog uk uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about Swisslog in a minute, but we're not going to go deaf by PowerPoint, so that's <laughs> me. Fantastic. Jason? Yeah, I'm the Divisional Director of uh, Big Box. Uh, good morning to everybody. And um, I get involved with all aspects of automation within the business, as well as intralogistics and warehouse buildings. And finally, Kevin Heath. Uh, yes, I am Kevin Heath. I work at Domatic. I uh, lead the global robotics uh, division, uh, which includes articulating arms, gantry robots, AMR technologies, um, and primarily things in the research and development field. So investigating new technologies, as well as solution development, which is assisting our account managers to selling new projects. Okay, fantastic. So I think a good place to start is to just get a sense of the sort of products and solutions that are on the market. And the way to do that is by going around each of you in turn and asking you just to talk for some minutes about what you offer. And I know there are some very diverse solutions there. And maybe we'll start with you, Kevin, shall we? Because Domatic, of course, is a very celebrated name in this sector. So uh, perhaps you could talk for a while for us on this. <clears throat> Happy to. <clears throat> So, yeah, so Domatica is uh, a large integrator of uh, material handling solutions. Um, let, let's say core business is ASRS uh, for pallets, totes, boxes, storing and retrieving those items. Uh, the conveying technologies that move between one automation component and another. We like to say anything inside of the four walls of a distribution center or a warehouse is, is really what we specialize in. Of course, making all of that automation work is a, is a W platform, WMS, WES, WCS. Uh, we offer all flavors of W platforms to support all of the different automation uh, components that are inside our house. Um, at Domatic, I mentioned the cranes and the conveyors. So. We also do a lot of AGVs, uh, so moving just in fixed paths, normally moving pallets of goods uh, between A and B. Um, High-speed sorters is another thing that Domatic is uh, really great at. Um, so slat sorters running at 400 or 500 cartons every minute. Um, definitely have those uh, core, core technologies in our, in our portfolio. Personally, I'm responsible for AMR technologies, so, so AGV light, some people like to say just to, to frame it up. Um, so those, whether they're pallet mover, shelf mover, uh, tote mover, ASRS, there's a variety of different AMR technologies that we have in our portfolio of offerings. Um, so I lead that group. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we, uh, I'm also responsible for uh, robotic automation, whether those be gantry type robots, usually we do gantries for layer handling, uh, maybe a 200 or 300 pallet field um, using a, a three axis Cartesian style robot. Um, also articulating arm robots for, uh, let's say, layer handling, case handling, palletizing, depalletizing. Um, and a growing sector for us is, is, uh, is, is automating the picking um, and the packing of, of the goods. Um, so a lot of our customers are retailers, 
Um, you can think of the big retailers in the world. I don't need to name names, but um, there are a lot of humans that are inside of those warehouses doing the picking and packing operations. And, and roboticizing those picking and packing operations is, is a, a key focus for us moving forward in, in these labor challenge times um, with, with rising costs of labor, uh, labor unavailability, um, labor quality issues. So, so automation is here to, to solve a lot of those problems and, and robots are a good component of that. Um, I think that's probably good enough for now and I'm sure we'll dive into more as we move forward. Thank you. Yeah, that's fantastic, Kevin. Um, we'll certainly talk about the human collaboration side a bit more, but just before I move on to, to Adam, um, I think it's worth just for anyone in our audience who isn't quite sure about this, they hear the words AMR and AGV used a lot. Just give us a definition. That, 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 uh, as I know that, that it can vary and you can get different answers from different people, but generally what is the difference between an AMR and an AGV? Yeah, good question. So AGV, Automated Guided Vehicle, right? That's what the acronym stands for. Um, it, it really, the difference between AGV and AMR, Autonomous Mobile Robot, uh, is, is twofold. So it's a navigation primarily. Navigation technique of an AGV is different than the navigation techniques used by AMRs. Uh, specifically, the difference is that on the AGV side, it's following a very fixed path between point A and point B. Uh, there can be different routes available to take, but they're all predefined paths. Um, AMRs, on the other hand, operate in a little different way, where they're more autonomous and more free to kind of make their own path as they need to. Um, they can either be in a, a very, we call it slam navigation, um, so you can, you can dynamically be finding your route as long as you're staying within the bounding box that, that is predefined for you. The AMR can find its own path throughout that course. Um, the other navigation style that AMRs oftentimes use is QR codes. So every, let's say meter or right around a meter, let's say, um, there's a QR code put on the floor and the AMR simply goes from QR code to QR code to QR code. And that's how it navigates. So uh, like I said, primarily the navigation is the difference. Okay, thank maybe you. One more, maybe one more flavor before we jump at them. AGVs oftentimes are moving pallets, while AMRs are oftentimes handling yeah. either a pallet at the biggest or smaller mm -hmm. than pallet, right? Down to a toad or a case size, or even an item, an individual item. So another different flavor for AMR versus AGV. Thanks. Thank you for that, Kevin. Uh, Adam, tell us about Swisslog and the range of solutions and products that you offer in this field. Yeah, so Swisslog, we, we have kind of uh, a, an aim or a strap line that says uh, Swisslog deliver data driven and robotic solutions for logistics automation. And I think it sums us up quite nicely. I mean, we, we, Swisslog are a manufacturing system integrator. That is, we make almost all of our own solutions that we deploy, uh, probably with the exception of Autostore, which I'm sure we'll touch on in this, this discussion. Swisslog are owned by uh, KUKA, who are one of the, the largest and leading robot manufacturers in the, in the world. Um, bit of history, Swisslog been going since 1904, so and big global presence, 27 offices, about a, a 2,200 employees, uh, about a quarter of which work in software. And we've already heard about uh, w, uh, w software and software is so important, hence so many people in our organization are deployed in that. The kind of solutions that, that we make uh, is everything from pallet solutions, whether that's pallet cranes going up and down or pallet shuttle solutions for high density, high throughput. We do a lot of unit load uh, solutions or light good solutions in terms of things like shuttles, things like mini loads, auto store, which I mentioned, and also AMR solutions that's been mentioned. We have a version called Carry Pick. And then we also get involved with robot, either uh, single skew palletizing or layer palletizing or mixed case palletizing, which is quite a big thing at the minute. And we also, um, same as, have a very good software platform. Uh, ours is called Sync, which covers uh, WMS or WCS or WES, as we've heard. Um, kind of so, sort of scale of companies we deal with. We uh, we do deal with those smaller uh, enterprises, predominantly 
with auto store and AMR solutions, equally going up to very large uh, sites with um, typically total automation or a specific application for automation. And the sort of markets we, we, we work in uh, are things like e-grocery, grocery supply chain, uh, CPG supply chain, and frozen supply chain, and e-commerce. And auto store also lends itself a lot to things like parts distribution, parts picking, and, and wholesale. So that's a bit of a potted uh, potted offering from, from Swisslog, really. And uh, I'm based here in the UK, and we have a nice, strong business here of about 277 people here. So that's us. Thank you very much, Adam. And then, Jason, um, Big Boss Automation perhaps has a slightly different business model. So what yeah, it does. So tell um, us about that. Yeah, so we're sort of integrators or partners, if you like. So in our previous nine, 10 years have been working with uh, retailers, 3PL, e-commerce businesses, all the global players. Um, so I don't have to mention names who they are. So I had relationships with all those people. And um, on the back of COVID um, and uh, presentations that I attended way back in 2018 in London, I could see the way the world was going. And uh, the, the forecast was that automation was going to come into the UK within seven to 10 years. Reality is, uh, on the back of Brexit and COVID and everything else that's actually been around us, everything's been brought forward. So we actually go into SMEs, uh, saying that we are talking to some global companies as well, um, and find out what their touch points are and what their biggest concerns are. And chiefly, mainly, it is labour, um, and that's the same problem up and down the country. And it can be a, a company that turns over £2 million or £150 million or a billion pounds, everybody has the same issue. And if on the back of COVID, if uh, companies have actually grown and they've potentially gone from two shifts to three shifts, they can't get the, the people for the third shift. Mm -hmm. So automation comes in many forms. So we look to see what the best option is for that customer. So it could be a conveyor, it could be an AGV, it could be AMRs, it could be shuttle systems, it could be scanning efficiencies. Um, so it all depends on what they want to achieve and what their roadmap is and, and what their strategy is over the next two, three years. So um, we work with uh, the likes of Grey Orange. And so we're in UK based with Grey Orange. So we will go in and discuss what Grey Orange can actually do with them. So Grey Orange can provide AMRs, um, now looking at AGVs and shuttle systems, goods to person sortation systems. So we actually have one in the UK and we're looking to. Uh, bring those into the UK as in talking to the global players. So they work with people like uh, Walmart, Adidas, GXO, some really um, uh, very uh, grown companies that have grown on the back of the last two years. So equally, uh, what we do is uh, if we can provide a solution, we can provide the racking and the fencing around these systems and the best floors to support what uh, these guys can do. So that makes it, um, companies are actually looking for one company to provide the whole project. So rather than having four or five companies, we can provide the whole project for them in one port of call. So we talk to anybody, as I say, from a £2 million turnover company, um, or indeed a £100 million turnover company, depending what their growth is and where their touch points are. So it really is... I suppose in some way you can actually say we're consultants, but we're not. We don't charge for our fee. The, the whole part of it is we work in partnership with these companies and grow with them on the back of what they're doing. I see. Right. Thank you for that. Um, coming back then from the wider theme of automation and robotics itself, we use, we've added this word affordability to this, to this panel because it, it seems like the message coming from the industry is, is that automation and robotics are now not just for the huge beasts of the industry. And I'd love to get your um, your reactions to that. I mean, you'd be a good place to start, Jason. So tell us, tell us is, is, is robotics and automation, are they, I should say, more affordable now for SME? Yeah, um, especially on the increase in minimum wage, uh, getting the right kind of staff. Um, and of course, the pressure's on the, the big boys paying extra salaries and incentives to stop with them. Um, automation becomes more and more attractive for businesses. And this can come in many shapes and forms. 
So, so it can be a simple, quite simple robot arm to move things around from one pallet to another. So relatively inexpensive. Um, I have to say that AMRs and shuttles and sortation systems are flow with a month at the moment because they are relatively more competitive than AGVs and more flexible, especially if 80% of your work is at ground floor level. But um, I think MES floors are obviously interest as well because um, if you've got 10, 15, 20 meters spare in your warehouse, um, you can't move because of the costs. So put a MES floor in and then automation can come in as well. So we work on the basis of return investment between two to three years, typically. Uh, any more than that, and then, then customers get a bit sort of concerned, well, um, what's going to happen in two, three years' time, especially on the back of what's happened with COVID the last two years. I think staff-wise, I don't think this issue is going to go away. I think it's here to stay, unfortunately. Um, so if you are going to grow to a third shift, well, then what do you do? The only way is automation. Um, and overall, so the return investment is, is coming down, in my opinion. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Jason. Kevin, can I, can I ask you about affordability and whether you think that is a, a, a reasonable proposition? Yeah, Jason outlined it really well already to start, but yeah, we, we do see the same um, on the back of labor, just like Jason has described. Uh, we do see that that ROI is typically two to three years, um, especially when you have a multi-shift operation. It, it makes all the sense in the world to, to automate a lot of these activities inside of the warehouse. Um, so okay. I, I, I think it's even beyond it's even beyond the UK, right? I mean, UK definitely has challenges, but but in my global role, I get to see all of APAC, all of all of the Americas. Um, and, and it's not an isolated incident, right? It, it's, it's globally a, a labor issue uh, with rising salaries, rising healthcare, rising safety concerns, right? All of these play into uh, justification of, of stretching that ROI sometimes to, to three or even more years uh, for certain businesses. So, and it is, it is the big guys, right? They've, they've been doing automation for years, but it's definitely bleeding down into, into the smaller players who are rapidly adopting and, and being fast followers of, of the large guys. So we, we definitely see that trend globally. Would you say that all the different territories and regions are moving at the same pace on this or are some faster than others? Uh, it depends on which technology we're talking about, but in the AMR space, I'll say that the, the I'll say the general European region is moving very quickly towards AMRs. Um, I'd say they're, less rapid in adopting robotic arm type technologies. Um, I'd say other global regions are doing much more adoption of, of arms and, and gantries as well. But AMR specifically, I'd say all of EU is doing a, a good job on, on recognizing the value of, of AMRs and adopting those into their automation solutions. And is that driven by e-commerce principally or um, I, the factors? Well, for sure the three PLs um, are, are I'd say all of them are adopting AMRs rapidly. Um, and a lot of times those 3PLs are doing e-commerce type work, right? So um, that I'd say those two correlate pretty well with each other, um, but, it, but it is also beyond e-commerce e as well, right? Even for more general distribution, uh, AMRs have a, have a space. In, in my perspective, one warehouse doesn't have a single technology inside of it. It, it should have maybe a pallet system and it should have a, a tote system and it should have a, a case system, right? So um, scaling up and down the different technologies, uh, AMRs definitely have a play in those, in those full solution warehouses. Sure, okay, thank you for that. Adam, this, this, anything to add to this question of a four? Yeah, I, I, think, I think to add, I mean, I would echo what, what, what's been said, but I think we have seen systems like AMRs and also particularly AutoStore, which is a, a type of autonomous robot, be it mounted on grids and retrieving bins in stacks. That they I'm seem going to, to interrupt you there, Adam. You've mentioned the auto store, and of course, it's it's, it's quite yeah. a celebrated system. Tell us, tell us, tell the uninitiated or members of our audience who are who aren't clear what auto store auto store is and how it works. 
Okay, so, so auto store, I'll probably use my hands a lot for this. So auto store really is a system where you store products in stacks of what they would call bins. And they're typically 650 by 450 and they do the bins in three heights, 220, uh, 330 and 425. Sorry, I don't know what that is in inches. So, uh, oh, and then you would stack these bins up, uh, normally uh, sort of 16 high for a, th uh, sorry, 14 high for a, for a 16 for a 330 and uh, 14 for a 425. So you, you have your, your items in stacks and you have a grid. And the purpose of that grid is to hold these bins uh, in, in a nice upright stack and to support mobile robots, autonomous mobile robots that are, traverse the grid above it. And what happens is they will um, pick a bin from the top of the grid and take it to a pick station or what's called ports in auto store world. And obviously the stock's not, not always gonna be in that top bin. So they will dig out and a process called dig in and place bins around uh, locally, get the bin they need, then take it to a station. But crucially what they do is then place the bins back in the order they came out. And what that does, it gives you this natural slotting because if a bin's not accessed very much, it will migrate to the bottom of a stack so you get a natural slotting of a's b's and z's so it's really a solution of very dense storage because the bins are all in the stack and um, you can have as many robots as you need uh, within reason there's some parameters around that but i think the reason it's taken off is so well is the one it's very dense two it's very scalable if you want to increase uh performance in terms of throughput, you can add more robots or you can add more picking ports. If you want to increase storage capacity, you just increase the grid and add more bins. But all of that expansion can be done without badly, uh, badly affecting ongoing operation. So it's very scalable from that point of view. And, and the other point is that um, it seems to have disconnected challenges, uh, uh, sort of macro level problems so micro level problems to macro level problems in so much that if you have a problem with one robot, the others can keep carrying on their operation. So you don't have these single points of failure. So a very clever system. Uh, so it's stacks of bins with robots picking them, taking them. What sort them. of clients would you would, 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 would be interested in auto store? Well, you know, uh, it goes, it varies. I mean, we're, we're seeing a, a rapid adoption for all, all sorts of different industries. A really good usage case we're seeing at the moment is it micro fulfillment for e-grocery and sort of customer fulfillment centers for e-grocery, for ambient and chilled. We see e-commerce a lot. You see a lot of um, a lot of deployments for uh, sportswear, particularly for clothing, for, for shoe boxes and things like that. Uh, trainers. Uh, another another big market is for parts distribution. These bins have got a really neat dividable uh, um, solution, a divider solution, so you can have different compartments within each bin. So you can store a lot of SKUs in a relatively small um, qubit space. So it's really e-com of all sorts and picking. Uh, I've even seen it done for archives as well. So it's anywhere where it's it, it it's it's uh, light goods or hand pickable auto store seems to be a very viable solution. I would add a caveat actually, it's not that great for big whole cartons in or out. So, but you know, for each picking, it's a really good solution. Okay, fantastic. Now I had interrupted you there because we were on the affordability question. Did you have anything you wanted to add in that, in that area? Yeah, well, I mean, on that auto store, we, we have seen auto store uh, sort of, enable uh, enable people uh, or companies to come in at a lower level because they, they can invest in a smaller system and grow it with their business over time. So we have seen that affordability more. The, the other thing on, on a different topic really is there's definitely more affordability and better ROI. Uh, an example of which we're seeing 3PLs adopt these solutions now, which we never saw so much um, sort of five, 10 years ago. So 3PLs are adopting 
uh, AMRs, auto store, and other solutions because they see it has a, has a payback, and often their clients will will also enter into a longer contract with them because they see that benefits and mitigating the risk of labour shortage or or price increase as well. Well, you've raised an interesting point there because I think one of the things in the past with three PLs might have been that. If a client changed, a system might not be flexible enough. Exactly. To that to exactly. Exactly. What, what yeah. would the panel say to that? Are, are these systems, once you have them, are they fixed or can they, are they scalable and able to be uh, made more flexible for different clients? I mean, let, let me come to you on that, Kevin. Yeah, so they, it depends on which technologies we oh, yeah, choose. Sure. When we apply AutoStore, just, just like Swiss Law, we do a lot of the same where it's easily expandable. It's also fairly easy to move from one facility to another or within the same facility. So we see good value from, from auto store with those regards. Um, when, when we get to some more traditional hard automation such as conveyors and sorters and, and shuttle-based ASRS or, or pallet ASRS, those are more, I'd call them hallmarks of the facility and, and expanding those and moving them is, is much more challenging. Um, so that's, that's one extreme. The opposite extreme I would say is, is on the AMR side, uh, with AMRs, it, it's, you know, it's literally a, a, a non-fixed piece of automation that you can add or take away and move and reconfigure. Um, so in, in that regard, it's quite easy to modify and reconfigure and relocate if need be. So, uh, we, we like AMRs when, when we're doing those types of operations that we know are, Maybe into the three PL space, and or or have a high high possibility of change year over year, or you know two or three years down the road. Okay, thank you for that. Well, we we've heard that there is a myriad of systems available, different types, different technologies, different products. So the question a customer must ask themselves is, where do I start? How how do I, how do I know I'm making the right decisions here? How do I begin that process? I'd like each of you to tell us how customers should begin that process. I mean, Jason, you'd be a good person to start on this. How, how does a customer set about the process of automating or indeed determining what automation is correct for them? Yeah, of course. So I'll just add a bit to the um, Adam's question as well about um, 3PLs. Um, that's a change of tact. Uh, because the, the margins on 3PLs are tight um, and they're getting tighter with obviously the increase in fuel costs. So that's quite a refreshing change for 3PLs to, to look at long-term rather than short-term. It all depends on the relationship they've got with their incumbent customers and how they sell the services. Because obviously they can't introduce technology and automation without a long-term contract. Um, so that has changed, which is quite refreshing. Mm. So to answer your question, um, yeah, where do you start? So we actually get inquiries from all kinds of organizations um, sometimes I've actually had meetings with people say, right, okay, after five minutes, how much is your robot? Um, <laughs> right, okay, based on what exactly? Um, so, or then you can actually go into quite a lot of depth, um, as in how many shifts, what they're picking, what the, uh, what the stress areas of the business are, um, do they work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, are they considered the floor? How many warehouses the got are looking to consolidate all these kind of things, so all these kind of areas um, and detail, and they can actually put a bit of a business plan together. The key is the information uh, from the customer, and I think uh, uh, Adam and Kevin will probably agree with me. Sometimes the information you get back from customers is not that accurate, um, and it's yeah, key. Yeah, it's key to get that information back and, and you can actually have uh, quite a few teams calls back and forward on the data you receive. So then you start to build up a picture of, about, of a proposal. But I think customers need to consider as well is the fact that it's not just the robot, it's actually the, the, uh, the grey matter uh, through grey orange that has to work with their current warehouse management system. And it has to be compatible, not indeed with one warehouse, but with all the warehouses and it's got to be flexible. Um, and also the flexibility includes when they're actually going to use the systems, if it's AMRs or cluster personal sortation systems. But what we are, offer is a, a flexible subscription service. So you only pay for when you use over a period of four or five years. So you haven't got to choose a couple of investments to start off with. 
you can spread the costs over that period of time. I think that's key, especially for an SME business who perhaps hasn't, hasn't actually considered that you could spread the costs. Um, so it really is fact finding um, and sitting down with the right people. It could be the owner of the, the business, because an SME tends to be. Um, the bigger businesses like the DHLs of this world will have their own in, innovation teams anyway. Um, as I said before at the start, um, if a business has grown on the back of COVID the last two years, they, they probably don't have innovation people. So they've grown by 10, 20, 30, 40, 50%, lost their way a bit. So they need something to hold their hand. So you bring in solution architects and actually sit down with them and say, right, okay, this is the best way. This is a quick win. What's your roadmap? What's your strategy for the next two, two three, four years? And what's your growth plan? And I think it's key to get all that detail out on the table sooner rather than later. And then you can actually um, start planning for where they want to be. And how long might that process take in your experience? Um, quite a bit of time. Um, and um, it depends how, uh, how proactive the business is. And uh, if the managing director, the owner of the business, or indeed the team, the board, um, can see the problems, everyone can actually see the issues they've got at the moment. So typically, it could be anything from six months to 12 months, possibly 18 months, the bigger the business is. Uh, because everything has to be done by committee and they've got RFPs and everything else to fill in, which takes time. Um, I can understand that because they've got to make the right decision. And um, there's obviously some nervousness, the bigger the company, how it's going to affect um, morale and what kind of feedback you're going to get from employees uh, at that business. That's in great detail there, Jason. Thanks for that. Um, I do want to ask the same question to the other two guys, though, because I think it's obviously an important one. Let's start with you, Adam. How do, yeah. how, how do customers embark on this process? I think they have to uh, think about what their aspirations are for, for, for anything that they want to automate. So what are their main aims? Are they uh, reducing labour costs or, or pushing back uh, uh, increasing their service offering, pushing back cutoff times, that sort of thing. So it's really about thinking automated, automated sake, and also thinking through, you know, what is viable to automate. Because obviously, a lot of the time, some some SKUs uh, just just move too fast or are too bulky or too awkward to automate. So we wouldn't want to do that. So consider what you want to automate and what your aspirations are for that. Um, are there any are there any wants they would have? You know, would they like to offer any additional services to their their their, their customers? You know, what value proposition is that? So it's really about you know what they're looking to achieve, then to consider what flexibility because we've all seen with COVID and, and and the challenges we have now that things do change. So have to consider with any automation system how it can be changed, uh, how it can flex to meet their future needs. Um, I guess that's the what. And, and, and if you're thinking about the how, um, another thing to consider is how do you implement an automation system whilst carrying on your current operation? So these, mm. this, this needs to be considered as well. You know, there's a lot of implications there. Also, when they're considering a system, um, it's already just been touched on about Data is always quite important, you know, and and it is it is a truism that data does vary quite a lot. You know, uh, organisations do their very best to give as much accurate data as possible, but we do see a lot of variance in that. So you know, it's the most accurate data is possible in terms of having a skew master, in terms of, of having. Um, order profiles or order line data for, for a year or whatever, and then inbound data, that really helps. W one point I did want to touch on on this when I consider it, and that is, do they, do they involve uh, an independent consultant or not involve an independent consultant? Because, you know, we, we all in what we do here, we'll take customers data and look at their process and everything and then deal with it. But a lot of, we see a lot of projects where they also involve an independent consultant. So if it's a very complex sister scheme or a complex operation, it, that might be a good thing to do but because Often what we will see when we're bidding for a project, we could be issued with some data sets and there could be, I don't know, uh, half a dozen bidders. And 
we could all have a different interpretation of the same data. So having a consultant can, can distill that and have one version of correct, if you like. So it is something to consider a consultant or not a consultant. And then obviously that's the, that was the what, the how, and then there's the when really, when is the right time to do your automation? Because you need to look at scheduling that because nobody wants to be automating if you're in retail anywhere near peak. You know, so, you know, when is the right time to implement this automation as well? So, yeah, quite a bit to consider. And, um, yeah, that, that's my view on it. There's some good stuff there. Thanks, Adam. I'm going to come back to you on disruption. I'm just writing that down now. But I'd like to come first, get, give Kevin a chance to answer on that in terms of how you approach the project with, with the client to, to ensure best practice. Yeah, so I think Jason and Adam both did a great job on, on outlining it to start. So I don't have a lot to add, but I, I would cool. say that customers need to understand that they've got a problem in the first place, right? So a lot of times you're so deep into the, your operations that they don't recognize that they've gone beyond what's, what's reasonable to sustain. So recognizing that they have a problem is, is step one. Uh, once once that recognition has happened, though, then, then we usually get involved to help them understand the problem, um, help them understand the operational value that they're bringing to their customers. Um, if Let's use an example uh, just for discussion here. So maybe a, a customer is, is doing a special value-added process inside of that fulfillment uh, chain, and, and the customer really finds a lot of value in that process. That might be something very specific that you don't want to automate, potentially. Um, while some of those more simple basic tasks inside of there that, that, the, that their customers aren't finding great value in, those are great ones to, to then automate. Um, so, so thinking through the actual operation inside of the warehouse um, is, is a, good, a good place to start. But then we talk about data, right? So we have the same data you know, issues um, with quality, but you, you really start at the same grounding spot with, with data, at least. Um, like Adam mentioned with a, the impartial third-party consultants, um, definitely a good strategy for, for operations that are planning on, um, like Adam mentioned, doing a competitive bidding situation. That, that common source of grounding truth um, then falls back to that consultative uh, company. Uh, but otherwise, I'm, I'm sure all three of our companies have the capability to do that work in-house as well um, as a double check of that consultant. So oftentimes that's step number one when yeah. we get a consulting opportunity uh, or one that's come in to us as an RFP, as an example. We'll, we'll go in and we'll double check the consultant's work to see does it make any sense at all or, or, or does it need to be redone, right? Um, so, so that's part of our standard process. Um, but yeah, um, starting with a consultative approach is, is definitely where we would recommend starting and, and trying to do it on their own is oftentimes not successful. So having a consultant, whether it's an impartial or one of our companies is, is our recommendation for sure. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, you, you did touch on the, the threat of disruption while this process is going on. Let's talk about strategies to avoid disruption because that's another fear that that companies might have when embarking on this process. How can you avoid disruptions to your processes? Let's start with you, Jason, on that. I think, again, it's, it's actually talking to um, customers about when they potentially want the installation. Um, Timescales can vary, especially in today's world. So typically we say between three to six months, uh, depending obviously um, how many of the fitting and where they're fitting within the business. So we have a bit of a, a schedule of works, if you like. So we present that to the customer and uh, say, right, okay, the installation will be on this time. So they can plan accordingly. So if they've got 10 people in one area, then five can potentially work in another area. So it doesn't affect sales. It doesn't affect their production. It doesn't affect what they're actually doing and their targeting. That's really important to do that. And the key time, as Adam actually said, retail is obviously a big lead up to Christmas. Um, we work with manufacturing companies and uh, the end of the year, December, is a quiet time. So that's perfect for us because most of the time people don't want you in buildings and warehouses and e-commerce fulfillment centres. So it's working with the customer and to ensure that the partnership is there and they trust you and what you're actually trying to achieve. 
and you agree to the time scales. Uh, sometimes it be with uh, with parts, parts are the key thing and all of this. Um, uh, we did an installation um, in the middle of COVID, which was uh, fun and games with getting the hold of parts, but we ensured that um, we talk to the customer on a regular basis to say, look, you know, this part's coming in. So the schedule slip a couple of days, as long as you're up front with people, um, then uh, you don't hide behind that fact, then the relationship will carry on. Um, but yeah, obviously every business doesn't want their um, uh, commerce sector disrupted. So it's all about working with them. Sure. Okay, Adam, disruption? Yeah, ju just before I touch on disruption, uh, I just thinking through what we said about what customers should think about, uh, I think what I would like to get over, all of us here, we all have something of a fast track option where I think we can look at projects and put budget prices to them because oftentimes customers don't know whether it will have a return on investment for them if it's viable. So I think everybody here in Swisslog, do, we do, I do this a lot, we do this a lot, we can with some fairly simplistic headers, uh, you know, what's coming in, what's going out, what needs storing, how much stock on hand, et cetera. We can come up with some fairly accurate budget prices that are quickly as well, not going into these uh, three to six months, but so customers can quickly establish if automation works for them. And then that process can go in at a deeper level. But, you know, I don't want any everybody out there to think that, Automation is always, at its very start, this very uh, all or nothing uh, expedition into data and process, because we can do it soft touch, early doors, budget pricing to see if it's viable. Um, moving on to disruption. Uh, so I think as well as timing, etc. There's a number of aspects we, we should consider. We often find if it's not a, a greenfield site, if it's a brownfield site, we will often often see that customers would like to have a, a phased installation. So they take part of the part of the solution um, so that they can absorb operations into that solution to free up space for a second phase. So you see with brownfield, phased installations is a good way of doing that. Um, because ultimately, most operations don't have a lot of space available free in, in their building because they tend to fill them. The, the other thing about disruption, I think what is worth bearing in mind, I'm sure, sure everybody on this call is the same. When we look at software integration, most of the work has been pre-done before we get to site, because obviously that can take quite a, quite a, a bit of time. So we tend to further down uh, uh, the, the, the project timeline, we will have started that software integration and most of that will be done ready to deploy when the hardware installation starts on site. So you haven't got that. So it, it is important for that to be done as well. So you've got software and hardware, and it's obviously about scheduling and, and conforming to CDM and everything like that as well. So, but it is something that needs working out with the vendor that you choose. Um, how to, to phase installation and things like that to make it work in your particular operation. But what you're saying is it's certainly a key part of the thinking from an early stage is that yeah. it's getting yeah. that threat. Okay. Um, Kevin, you, you spoke earlier about the different range of automated assets that might be available to a customer in a warehouse mm -hmm. environment. That brings us on to the question of interoperability and getting them to speak to each other. Is that is that something that's feasible now so that, that all the different assets and different fleets and systems can com communicate with each other or be controlled by the central source? Uh, yeah, de definitely the uh, communication platform is that W platform uh, is able to communicate to all different types of technology. Um, and we have, at Domatic, we have a very structured uh, let's say architecture uh, of that software platform, um, whether it's the W platform or down at some translation layers or down at the machine level, it's a very structured and, and very connected uh, data flow. So no real concerns um, there in, in any way. Um, we're very intentional about, about doing it that way. Back, yeah. Backing up though to uh, disruption though, I'd maybe quick touch on that because the Matic might take a slightly different approach Okay. And I would like to put a spin on it from a robotics uh, perspective as well. Um, I would say that if we know we're walking, 
before I start. I'd say Adam and, and Jason did a great job on, on talking about kind of overall master planning and schedules. But if we get finite about it, if we have an opportunity that needs something very specific, right? We have a very limited time window. We, we have that might limit your possible uh, hardware to, to certain aspects. Maybe you, maybe you can't do an auto store as an example because it just takes too long to stand up all the whole grid. So that might say, okay, well, that one's off the table. Maybe hard automation is off the table and we have to focus on an AMR solution, right? Mm -hmm. Because AMRs are very rapid to stand up. Um, it's, it's weeks, not months. Um, so so those, are, those are some aspects that we wanna think about. When we do have hard automation, we like to say islands of automation. Um, a lot of times we'll build that island on a, on a skid and, and we'll do a factory acceptance test or pre-build offsite, bring that in as one bundled pre-assembled component and set it in place so that there is very rapid uh, adoption and the very rapid standing up on site. So I just wanted to circle back. I didn't hear Adam or Jason talk about that island of automation concept or the pre-packaged approach, um, but that is something that we can also bring to, to customers to leverage that schedule optimization. Well, uh, Kevin, I, I agree. The, the proof of concept with some of the customers we're talking to is hugely important to win confidence with the colleagues and the people that are, are uh, spending the money. So um, that mean could mean two to four just a personal, you know, a selection of sortation systems. Uh, mm -hmm. So walk before you can run. Um, and I think that's a key element to, to win confidence because people are generally quite nervous about using some kind of robotic system. And if you can actually picture it in there for six months, prove its worth, then it will grow um, to all aspects of the business. As I said, we're talking about affordability. So what about payment models? I think you've touched on it. You mentioned it there, Jason. Adam, you said earlier about starting with a small system, perhaps, and then checking that it works so that, it, so that the investment is not quite as high. Are there other, other things the industry can do to help clients who are worried about affordability at an early stage with CapEx, et cetera? Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, if I answer that, so there is tax breaks, um, which are still available in the UK. Um, on the um, on the hardware side, so uh, we do encourage that when we talk to customers, um, and also the fact that they can actually spread the costs as well. So you don't have to you know, spend half a million, million pounds, two million pounds, whatever it is, in thirty to sixty days. You can spread those costs, so that becomes more affordable and more flexible for the customer. So um, with the interest rates obviously being so low as they are, um, it's a good time to actually have a proof of concept and to encourage this um, to win confidence. Um, I think that's hugely important to do. Thank you for that, Jason. Adam, any, any thoughts on that? Can I, uh, can I just go back to the bit about uh, controlling everything as well? Because uh, I, think, I think a very good point was made there. So we, you will find uh, uh, that, that system integrators like ourselves and, and, and touch some by Domatic is we do have very comprehensive uh, W level um, software. So our version is called Sync and, you, and that can control all aspects of automation things. So whether that's sorters, palletizers, whatever that's required. And equally we can 3D visualize it as well. So just to, to, to make potential buyers of automation understand that it can all be controlled from one central software platform. So, uh, you know, so, so that, that is covered and it works very efficiently as well and gives a fantastic overview of it. Um, back on, we were talking about affordability, weren't we? So in terms of, of, of payment models, I mean, there's obviously the purchase payment models, but we are seeing more companies want to explore leasing models as well for, for, for purchases. And, and sometimes we even get, get, get uh, asked for, for models such as uh, pay per pick, et cetera, which is almost, mm. you know, it's almost automation as a service, I guess. So, um, which I expect to grow, uh, and, but it's early days on that, I think. But certainly there's more routes to market for customers to be able to fund automation. And then of course, obviously, we, we all need to go back to the return on investment in the first place to make sure it works for them, but yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, Kevin? For us, we're, we're definitely seeing a hybrid model emerge where, where there is a, a, a 
capex component to it, but then there's an opex component as well, where where maybe we're doing a robot as a service, whether it's mobile automation, AMRs, or maybe it's a, a piece picking robot um, being paid by a pick. Um, kind of blending those two models into a single operational facility is uh, seems to be the trend that we're we're most interested in moving forward. Um, I'd say as a domatic and, and probably the same for, for the others, we'd rather have CapEx, right? We, we'd like to have that money at the end of the project, but operationally the customers value that OPEX, that ongoing OPEX is, is more valuable than having that CapEx and that initial outlay. So um, it is a model that we're definitely uh, considering uh, project by project. Okay, fantastic. Well, I think we're pretty much out of time. So let's just have one last quick whip round the panel. One bit of advice to, uh, to, to future clients on this, maybe a couple of sentences on do's and don'ts. Start yeah, so with, uh, start. with you. Yeah, so, yeah. so uh, cognitive approach, be patient through the early days of the project as we, as we learn your business really, really well. Uh, we need to be ingrained and, and learn it intimately so that we can be your, your uh, representative or your proponent as we're developing the solution, being very collaborative through that selling process. Um, one more is we're, we're in the COVID days, we're emerging out of that and there's still supply chain issues. So please be patient with us and I'm sure everyone else on this call as, as we're all dealing with the supply chain shortages. Um, we're emerging and I think we're all, I'm sure we're all taking tactical action to recover from that, but be patient through the execution. Um, and then consider, consider alternate uh, technologies that you may not have thought about. So, so yes, you can do a lot of YouTube searching and, and Google searching and find cool tech. Um, some of it's real and some of it's not. So that's what we're here to help you with is to, to weed through those uh, potential options and help you come in on exactly what uh, the right solution is for you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Adam? Yeah, I, I would suggest, suggest to people uh, sort of go to a number of vendors to see who, who you feel best suits your, your business and, and, and you get some confidence in. I would also advise to, to, to go and see some sites as well of their existing customers to see ongoing operations because you get some fantastic ideas when you're going to visit them sites and, and one thing we we haven't covered as well during these discussions you, know, you need to think of, of total cost of ownership as well what that looks like and what i mean by that is including things like uh, potential sprinkler systems including things like service and support operations that are needed so consider what that's going to cost and who and how that's going to done. I'm sure everybody on this call will have, have operations like we do to support customers. So it's a bigger picture that needs looking at in terms of that and return investment. But yeah, you know, automation, we're going to see a uh, dramatic expansion of it. And, you know, um, be nice to hear from anybody who's considering it really. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And Jason. Yeah. Uh Exactly agree with you, Adam, on total cost ownership. Uh, that's key. And I think honesty and integrity with customers, it's not just about selling the automation process. It's about factoring other areas of the business as well that you possibly might have to change to factor what you're bringing into the business and make people aware of that at the early stages rather than you know six months down the line. Um, so it's thinking about the entire business and how they're going to move forward. And I think if you can start that with your first couple of meetings, then your relationship and partnership will hopefully go in the right direction. Thank you for that, Jason. And, and thanks to all of our panel. I think there's been some great insight and some reassurance, really, on what automation is and what it means. And, of course, the incredible variety of opportunities that it offers. So that does conclude our panel on this. Do keep your questions coming. Uh, and we will de be delighted to pass them on to the panel. Uh, but meanwhile, thanks to Jason Dyche, Adam Fox, Kevin Heath, and I'll look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.